food and fellowship at 5 o'clock and worship at 6. It's a shorter service that is reminiscent of camp, um, camp style worship, and very child and intergenerational friendly. So look forward to having you be a part of these different offerings. Mary Catherine is on sabbatical, and um, I don't think she's in the air yet, but she is on sabbatical and is taking that rest that she needs. Um, big special offering today, the Pentecost offering, is one that is especially geared towards youth and young adults. And as many of you know, youth and young adults have been struggling enormously for centuries. <laughs> but especially now. Um, the, the rise of devices and distance learning and all that went with these last few years of COVID has made it especially difficult. And so these ministries are powerful and important. And this special offering is, as you can see in the insert, it goes into detail of where the money will be used. Some 40% of it here in this church and the rest around in various ministries. Uh, please sign in with the friendship pads. And if you have a prayer concern or a desire to talk to a pastor or an elder, please write that on there and we would love to meet with you. Now, as you can see, we have some red in the room. And you may know about Pentecost. It looks like a bunch of you saw the memo of red. And that's great. And this, this is... One of the few times red shows up in our, in our um, liturgical calendar. And it is a very special time because it is all about the gift of the Spirit. I had a professor once say the gift of the Spirit is something that the Presbyterians have not really worked with very much. We do it collectively and through our heads, but we're kind of afraid of that movement and that chaotic element to it. And today... We will explore the gift of the Spirit together as we celebrate Pentecost and as we also gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So please join us now as we worship God.
please rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship. Oh, my soul, bless God. Beautifully, gloriously robed. You set the beams of your home on the ocean deeps. You make a chariot out of clouds. You rise and the wind is your wind. You make the wind your messenger. Fire and flame are your ambassadors. You make the springs press forth from the mountains. They are swelled from the mountain slopes. Giving drink to every wild animal, even desert creatures quench their thirst. The earth is I will sing to the Creator as long as I live. I will praise God as long as I have my being. be seated. Trusting in the promise of grace, let us tell the whole truth about ourselves and beg God's mercy for the renewal and amendment of our lives using our prayer of confession and our God to worship. Creating God, we pray. Aspiring to be saved while we are in the world, transform our marvelous mixture of both weal and woe. We know the misery of falling and death, of the human shortcomings of pride, greed, and gluttony, when our perceptions are so shattered by the human condition, we are blinded and can hardly find comfort. Give us the joy of the risen Christ, lifting us by the touch of his grace. 
We trust that Christ calls us forth to live a full life of love, a whole life of trust, a life of simple abundance where love is our God. Even as we confess our sins and shortcomings, may we find true peace and true joy and radiate it in the world in all things. O oh Lord, hear our prayers of confession. God hears our prayers with mercy and with grace. Friends, all will be well through Christ. this Pentecost Sunday, we invite the Spirit to work between us and from us. And one thing you may have noticed in the narthex was all those different languages, right? And so I invite you, how many of you know at least one other language? Or at least have a few words? You all know shalom, right? Okay. Or pax. Or other words that might be a greeting. So I invite you, um, maybe with some distancing because COVID continues to filter around, um, to greet one another with this, a, a piece from another language, but especially with the Spirit living in and through you. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Shalom. there are any children in the church, I invite you to come down to the front. Children of all ages are welcome to come down to the front. Do I have any children? I know there's a couple. Here comes Harrison. Good morning, Harrison. You can have a seat right next to me. Today I'm going to read a story because we are talking about, today is Pentecost in the church. What color do you see everywhere that a lot of people are wearing? And the pyramids and the flags, what color are they? Red. I see a lot of red out there today. Do you see a lot of red? Yes. It's the color that symbolizes Pentecost. And today I'm going to read a book. It's called The Day When God Made Church. Have you read this book before? No? It's a really interesting book. I don't have Francis here today to hold it for me. Pastor David's going to hold it. 
It says, we all gather and wait. Jesus is gone and we are nervous. Everyone is curious to meet the one that Jesus would send us. The room is dark. Men, women, old and young, and animals wait. They wait for something to happen. Suddenly, the animals move with excitement. What's that noise? It grows louder. It feels like wind and pounds like drum beats. It fills the room loud and full. See how it fills the room? Then the room grows brighter. Something hot and blazing shines on us. Darkness is gone. Fire fills the cold space. And now we feel warm inside our bodies. Smiles paint our faces, and we all know something new is happening. We feel our hearts change inside. Is this what Jesus promised? A new sound comes. Words. Words like raindrops fall across the room. Some with loud sounds, some with quiet whispers. Words like drum beats tiptoe through the air. People crowd around. They hear the words. They recognize the languages. Something new is happening. The Holy Spirit has arrived. Everyone around me begins to ask questions. Who is this Holy Spirit? What is happening? Why do we feel so different? Why do we hear so many languages? Peter stands. He walks around looking at each of us. I wonder, is he going to speak? And then Peter opens his mouth and he starts to preach. powerful voice feel, fills the spaces around us and between us. Friends, something new is happening. Jesus has given us a wonderful gift. Don't be surprised if you all start to preach and dream too. Young and old, men and women, we all are called to be something new. God is changing us so we can see old things in a new way. We all listen as Peter tells the story of God's love in Jesus. He reminds us all what Jesus taught us. And we hear again how Jesus loves us. We remember when Jesus healed our friends and told us stories and shared good news. We listen as Peter describes the day that horrible day when Jesus hung on the cross and we remember how sad we were. The dark clouds covered the sky, the earth shook, and Jesus died to save us. But our sadness did not last forever. Peter reminded us that soon there was joy, laughter, and dancing. Jesus came back to us. God raised him from the dead and gave us new life. We all hear the word Peter preaches, and the Holy Spirit changes us. The rivers of baptism pour out, and we feel God's love. A love for us, our families, our friends, and even people who are far away. People, people everywhere all hear this good news. We all begin this new life together. We become a new family. We share our things. We break bread together and we worship God. This is what we call the day of Pentecost. 
the day when church was born. Men and women, boys and girls, people from everywhere, we are all filled with the Holy Spirit, and we worship Jesus, alive and risen. Alleluia. Thank you, Harrison. You may go have a seat. Please join me in prayer. Loving and faithful God, God of grace, God who shines in glory, we ask that you will open our hearts and our minds to your message this day. Amen. The reading this morning could have been from Joel, because that's what this passage sort of where it starts. But it is from the book of Acts, and Brittany told that story well or shared it and acts you may know is sort of part two of luke probably the same author and definitely uh the same lineage and the same story of movement of a road and so a lot of these two these books are are very dependent on the exodus and the road out, the road out of Egypt. So this theme just keeps coming back, and we see it again today in the second chapter of Acts. I like Luke so much I was in Luke, sorry. <laughs> so the first chapter, we have Jesus appearing and offering the power of the Spirit, and saying it will come. And we have to imagine how afraid, how upset, how disillusioned these early followers of Jesus were after his death and departure and all of the persecution and potential murder that could come their way. So in this second chapter, we begin with the day of Pentecost. When that day had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven... There came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard, each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astounded, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. Everyone was amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, well, what, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Friends, may we hear this message today. Lots of fear. Lots of anxiety. Does that sound familiar? Now, so this is why I didn't preach on Joel, because Joel is a prophet, and he's not going to uh, give us too much assurance that thing, everything's going to be all right. 
but Acts does. So I remember the fear and uncertainty that I felt when my father handed over our family garden for me to take care of. Fortunately, I'd helped for years, and almost everyone around had big gardens in their backyards. How many of you had a garden in your day in your backyard? And how about going back a generation, your parents and grandparents? Lots of gardens, right. So even before Victory Gardens, everyone had gardens. You might have had chickens and pigs too, right? Well, we also had a subscription to Mother Earth News. Have you seen that magazine? Okay. <laughs> it's all the do-it-yourselves of small farm, do-it-yourself activities of small farms, what they call out west hobby farms, uh, things that you can do on your own. And I was reading it at age 12 and 13. And I learned all about composting. You know it's one of my favorites. And mulching. And my confidence grew each time I could bring something special to the family table. It grew with the fresh, sweet, and tart strawberries. It grew with the butter crunch lettuce. Have any of you eaten that when it was fresh? Okay, it just melts in your mouth. And how about zucchini? This was the age of zucchini. Do you remember? We couldn't give it away. It was just prolific, and you'd make everything out of it. Zucchini bread, zucchini dumplings, everything. There was enough to fill a bushel basket for our small family. So there's something pretty amazing about summer harvest and those first fruits and vegetables as a young person where I brought it forth to the table. Something incredibly special, and it's especially special when you're 11, 12, 13, 14. Something is at work that's bigger than you, and you realize it. So this challenge from my father and this work was one of my early successes. It helped me to forge my identity. And all of us can appreciate those successes when we're children or, or adolescents, right? Think of your own. What did you do early on that you remember? Maybe it was a painting something you knitted, something you built, a birdhouse, a dam you built for fun, horses you learned to take care of, all kinds of things, right? And we also learned that we could outgrow places where we may have felt insecure, anxious, or stuck. And throughout the Bible stories, God always is appreciating these first fruits, Right? You know, God demands them, demands the first fruits, and that we bring them forth. So, in that process of growing up and in that process of discovering who we are, there is an act of God to, for us to find that calling that's deep within us and grow forward. So, on this birthday of the church, this Pentecost Sunday, we celebrate the first fruits, and I added vegetables, of the church. Pentecost Day is the story of those first Jewish and Gentile followers when they were incredibly afraid and incredibly stuck. They needed to understand what had just happened with this death. What had happened? And how would they, with all these different nationalities and political concerns coming together, how would they make sense of, a, of a, all of it? What would they do? And this message today was not just a message for Israel that fit the old model, the old paradigm. This was a message of explosion. Like when a seed pod bursts and seeds go everywhere. Well, they did probably have all these anxieties that newly forming communities have. When the founder falls off or when the founder disappears or grows old and retires, or with Jesus, was killed brutally. They had to ask themselves over and again, was he the prophet? A prophet like Elijah? And then the appearances start happening. Something was different here. Something was different about him. Was he going to restore Israel? That question just keeps coming up. Like Moses restored Israel when they were slaves in Egypt? 
or like Eliza, where the promise just keeps coming? And then what do we do with that? Today, it seems like we don't ask these same questions, do we? Like, which laws do we have to follow now with these Gentiles all around us? Do we have to keep kosher? Do we have to do all the cleanliness and purity laws? And ultimately, what are we to believe when there's only supposed to be one God? The strongest, strongest statement of Judaism. Well, this story is a foundational story of Judaism, and it is called, um, this particular holiday is called the Feast of the Weeks. So this existed before, the Christ, before Christians took it on, and they called it Pentecost. And the tradition at this point was to celebrate and give thanks and bring offerings of the first grain of the summer. That first grain, and the wheat harvest was happening, and in Leviticus, it's also a marking of the giving of the Torah, the giving of the order that happened on Mount Sinai. It's all about bounty, loaves of fish, loaves of fresh break bread, and the order that God intends for humanity. So, in the story today, there are some echoes of this, aren't there? There are some similar themes here. God giving those Ten Commandments to Moses. Well, think about the echoes. When God gave the Ten Commandments on the mountain, there was smoke and cloud. There was smoke and clouds around the mountains. There was a loud noise, like a loud trumpet. And there were flames and fire and thunder. And then there was a voice. There were voices and a voice that reminded them of their freedom and that God was the one that gave them freedom. But now in Acts, God's connection with us is a little different, isn't it? It isn't through Moses the same way. Moses is still important, and the stone tablets are still important, but they're not on the mountain now. And the visit from God is not nearly as visually direct, is it? It's very indirect. It makes Presbyterians especially uncomfortable, right? Because we have our book of order and book of confessions to ground us and the Bible to ground us. But this spirit is slippery and evasive, unknown, like wind, literally the wind. So what we have here is a recasting of a vision of God a recasting of a vision of God. It's another theophany, which is a vision of God. But this time, God is interacting not only with prophets and not only with Jesus, but through everyone in the room. Everyone in their own language. Jesus told them this would happen. He appeared to the disciples and he told them the Holy Spirit would come. It would also give them the power of the Holy Spirit. And now we have this strange occurrence, this very strange occurrence. Peter connects the event with the last days and with the prophet Joel. And he said, this will happen. It is like a wild, untamed story. And here it is now. We don't focus a lot on those last days in this church, uh, or as Presbyterians. We may even say, hey, maybe that's just a giant symbol to be awake all the time. What does it have to do with us, though? Maybe this is just a leap a little too, too large to take. But I think there's something very powerful here. When I go back to my garden story, I didn't do that myself. I had my parents and my grandparents, and my neighbors, and my sisters. And my first fruits were part of community. They were part of something far bigger than I could even imagine. And I was just one little part of it. What would it be like to really understand what people are saying in their language and in your language? To truly understand each other may just be our greatest challenge. 
you may see this organization spend billions of dollars trying to communicate better, right? It happens all the time. And if you think about close relationships, friendships, or spouses, they usually cite communication as the top challenge in a relationship. That's often the first thing that comes up in marriage counseling. And I'm not talking about just getting words or a simple message. I'm talking about getting out of the way with your own narrative, your own story, that old story, and living in to your feelings so that you can actually be present. And then you may be able to enter the feelings and the story of the person you're working with or the group you're working with. And most of you have probably had that shift from not knowing and not understanding to sometimes a painful awakening of what's really going on in a relationship. It's amazing when we truly connect. It's like a miracle. It may be between a father and a son who have been estranged for 20 years. It could be between a father and a daughter during adolescence, a distance for a few years, or a father and a son during adolescence. It could be a business partner where they just could not do conflict. It can clog up really easily, can't it? So when we go to Guatemala as a church and we send groups down to Guatemala, our partners at Ebenezer don't speak much English, and some of them don't speak much Spanish. They're speaking their native tongue. But we rely on just these fragments of Spanish. And when we finally make a connection, it's this moment of joy. Oh, it's dinner time. <laughs> oh, you want me to move it over here. Something starts to click. It's the same way with our Afghan family. We're sitting there struggling. We're working with a uh, translation on the phones, and we're getting fragments, and words are not really flowing in. But then when we do connect, there's an aha moment of joy. And this is a great obstacle. It's been the greatest obstacle with the support of our Afghan family. We need a translator. But when we think about being able to speak the same language, we do have to go even deeper than just English, don't we? We're watching body language. We're watching the feelings and being attentive to what is going on in a relationship. And when you do hear what a gift it is when you do connect. How do we do it? Well, we'll put a lot of effort into it. And you may have heard of this very popular thing of love languages. How many of you have heard of love languages? Okay, I'll give you a brief description. It's sort of a popular thing that's out there, and that is that we have a language where we are going to connect with someone, and it may be very different from the person next to us, from a friend or a relative or a spouse, anything. And so one love language is physical touch. So you feel it when you're touched. It, it just goes yards. It goes distances to have touch. Another, for some people, is quality time. Just being together. Eating a meal together, sitting together, listening, watching. Another is receiving gifts. How many of you receive gifts and just feel like, oh, I'm loved? How many of you, when you receive a gift? I do. Yeah. How about acts of service when someone does something for you? They sew up a, a, a jacket that ripped, or they, <laughs> they um, do the dishes, they cook a meal, they do the yard, they do their work. Incredible amounts of service build this deep connection. Another one would be, you may be doing all those things, but if you haven't said affirming words, some people have to hear it. They have to feel appreciated. They have to hear it in words. And I would like to add, as there's a billboard over in East Asheville that says, 
food, the great love language. <laughs> so um, the idea of sitting down together and eating and enjoying food together. But this basic idea is that when you, are, when you take the time and effort to know what the other person's love language is or what really speak to them, all of a sudden something happens. Trust grows. Feelings of goodness grow. Intimacy grows. There are little joyous moments when someone gets it right. And it's incredibly painful when it's still missing. It just keeps getting missed. You may know also another, another thing that people work with is temperaments or types. How many of you are familiar with um, the Myers-Briggs type indicator? Okay. And another thing might be the Enneagram. How many of you are familiar with that? That's another one. Well, all this goes back to Galen in uh, the Roman physician Galen who came up with four basic types and then they all would spin off. But the four basic types would be fiery. These are your super powerful people who sort of forge ahead and don't really look back much, right? So we'll give them the red color today, the fire people. And then there are the playful people who are happier to play and be in the moment and kind of go here and go there. And their color might be yellow, like a butterfly. And then there are reflective people who are sort of like the moon. They sit and they give back and they listen and they reflect. And they move a lot more slowly than the other two. And then there's the folks, oh, their color would have been, might be purple. And then, then there's a group that is blue, and you may know what they are. They are the melancholics. They're going to feel everything very deeply, and they're going to sit with it, maybe for a long time. So rather than ridicule any of these or, or, or put any value judgments on them, the amazing thing is that they all are in play, and actually all four are in play in all of us. They're just to different degrees. But the knowledge and the depth of digging in to real languages and real ways of being allows us to build community in a greater way. I would add that um, only some true things uh, that, are, that are so hard to reach are what, are what we're grasping for. These are empathy. These are intimacy. These are the deep connections. These are why we stay in a church, hopefully. Because things start to happen where you feel like you are a part of a community. And many times we may miss it because we're so much in our own worldview or our own type that it's so hard to get into someone else's mind, right? So there's this almost super trite saying that we, we've heard, all of you know it, that we need to walk in another person's shoes, right? Before we can truly understand them or walk in their moccasins. Um, and there was this psychologist named Edward Titchener who introduced the word empathy to us here in the United States. He was German. And in 1909, he brought this word across. It was Einfühlung, Einfühlung. And it originally meant being able to relate to the experience of another person by mirroring it in one's mind. So there's some effort here. There's some work. Well, my hope for us today is that with the enormity and the difficulty of building community, and that's not just this community, this is the where it's hard, right? Where we're struggling so much as a nation. The enormity of that is so big that we have to rely and trust and ask for the Holy Spirit to lead us into this. It's bigger than us. Not only is it bigger than each individual's ability and will to do it, but it's bigger in the community because it's so hard and full of traps and mistakes and getting stuck. So this early church, there's this idyllic little period in the second chapter of Acts where some people just say, hey, this was just an ideal thing. It couldn't have happened like this. Where they share everything, food, money, possessions. They work together and listen to the Holy Spirit.
and they are so connected, as this text today says, even with the Jewish background and multiple different kinds of Jews, different sects of Judaism, and then all the Gentiles and different nationalities, it must have been impossible. But meanwhile, they relied on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. It couldn't be possible without the Holy Spirit. That's what our text says. I would also argue that our concept of communion, what we do when we gather, and what we do when we open this table very, very wide, when we do that, we're asking for difficult communication. We're asking for a lot of struggle. And at the same time, we are confidently asserting that this is worth it. This is what the Spirit calls for. And the presence of this community, the remembrance of all that Christ did and lived and was and still who is, all happens here at this table. This is a new way. And we have to come back to it again and again. A new way for each of us and community to find these first fruits. It seems a little idealistic, but that's why we're here. May God bless to us a message today. Because God first loved us, we are made to love one another for the sake of the world. Offer yourselves your time and your possessions as signs of love. As the tithes are collected this morning, we're going to invite you to participate in our offertory. The refrain is in the bulletin. Uh, I, I'm fairly evangelical about this song. I love it. And we've done it recently in the first leg service. It's called She Flies On. And I'm going to show you the melody one time real quick. Sing along with me in the bulletin. She comes in.
friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south to be at table with our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Only then were their eyes opened and they recognized him. Friends, this is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast which he has prepared. As we gather around this table, the faith of all those who have gone before join us in this journey. Come to Christ's table this day, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Not because of an obligation, but because you seek a presence. Come and let us rejoice and remember all that God does for us. The Lord be with you. And so with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Divine Spirit who hovered over creation and brought order out of formlessness, we praise your Spirit. You cast your seeds out upon the chaos and pastures overflowed with flocks. Valleys brought forth flowers to welcome you. Mountains sang out their praises to you as trees clapped their hands. You shaped us in your image to enjoy and care for the generous gift of life, but we chose to walk the rocky paths full of thorns, choking us off from your hopes for us. Prophets came to us with awakening words, speaking truth to power, hoping to lead us back to you in peace, but we sent them away empty-handed, scattering their words like breadcrumbs left for birds of prey. Yet you would not leave us lost and sent your divine spirit who filled Jesus with strength and wisdom to seek us out and find us. He lived a new way of living and loving, a way of life that produces good soil, fruits and vegetables for your way. So with those who have sung the song of grace and hope in every time and place, and with those who are just learning the words, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Your spirit fills the earth with hope, and Jesus Christ is the everlasting sign we will not be separated from you. You walk the dusty paths, picking us up from where the world had cast us aside. He prunes all the twisted briars of sin and death so that your resurrection might bloom for us all. Sanctify us by your Holy Spirit that we might be faithful in Christ's garden of hope, love, and beauty modeling his behavior, trusting in abundance rather than scarcity, following his call as we are sent out to share God's fruitful abundance of the world in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith.
The farmer sows the seeds and the grain comes forth to provide substance for the bread. The snow and the rain refresh the roots. The grapes ripen on the vines to fill the cup of life. Your spirit gathers us these gifts and prepares the table for your people who, blessed with your presence, go forth to bring hope and life to others and who, set free to love, go to release neighbors and strangers from hunger, fear, doubts, and loneliness. Let us always gather with our sisters and brothers around your table of grace and peace. And satisfied with your goodness, we will join all creation in praising you. In union with Christ's offering, we lift our prayers to you as you taught us to pray. All honor and glory is yours, creator, now and forever. Now let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered in the upper room with his followers and disciples, and he took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the bread of life. This is the cup of salvation. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Left side, as you come up, will be have a gluten-free possibility. We'll come up in two lines and take our elements by intention.
Has everyone been fed? Please join me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, your food is the food of the spirit that nourishes our body, our minds, our souls, our community. We ask that this blessing today of your life may live in our lives, and may we take it out for each moment of each day. Amen. This benediction is one we have been using with children and families and can evolve into rounds and all kinds of things, but let's learn it together today.